calor. I call the members to order. And as we begin, I would like to take the opportunity to welcome the delegation from the Sudanese parliament who are visiting our parliament today. Welcome. Our first item is questions to the First Minister and the first question, Janet Finch Saunders. Will the First Minister make a statement on the Welsh Government's support for the farming industry in Wales? Yes, we will continue to work side by side with our farmers and other key stakeholders to deliver our shared vision of a prosperous, resilient agriculture industry. Thank you. Panorama this week looks at how Brexit could impact on our farmers here in Wales. Now, as Mr Jacob Anthony from your constituency said on the programme, the EU has one agricultural policy that's meant to fit all 28 nations, countries farming reindeer in the Arctic Circle, all the way down to farmers in the Mediterranean growing olives. How are you therefore working with the UK Environment Secretary and others to include the Farmers Union of Wales towards developing the best possible deal for our farmers that is better suited to Wales? And will you outline your response to the NFU's policy document, Vision for the Future of Farming, a new domestic agricultural policy? Uh, was not actually correct uh, to say that this is one size fits all uh, in, in Europe. Of course, there are variations across uh, across Europe, uh, and nor should it be the case that one size should fit all. Nor should it be the case that one size should fit all in the UK, for that matter, because our farming is quite different. The structure of our farming is quite different, for example, to that of many parts of, of England. We would be more than happy to work with the uh, DEFRA Secretary of State if only he would bother to meet with us, because one of the things that he did was to cancel. His meetings, uh, his, his quadrilateral meetings with uh, Leslie Griffiths, his minister of Scotland, for last month and this month. Uh, so we're more than happy to meet with him. I'm sure, the minister would, would, was, is looking forward to doing that. I understand he will be at the Royal Welsh. Perhaps he will meet uh, with us then. But uh, what I can say absolutely clearly is that it is, does not bode well when the first action of a deaf Secretary of State is to cancel meetings with devolved administrations. And secondly, uh, it is hugely important that when the uh, repeal bill is published, that there is an acknowledgement that it is not for the UK government to take the powers away from Brussels that should come to Wales and keep them in London. Under no circumstances will we support that. Does the First Minister agree that we should look into the possibility of um, and, um, employing an experienced um, industrialist to ensure that if there are any barriers to farmers in terms of high tariffs in accessing the European market that we can save what we can of Welsh agriculture through ensuring that far more Welsh produce is procured for our schools and hospitals, even if that costs a little more, and that this industrialist could also be responsible for developing better collaboration between farmers in order to ensure that Welsh food, which is of high quality and can be provided in a reliable way to Welsh supermarkets and supermarkets across the UK? Well, first of all, of course, any kind of tariff would be a disaster for Welsh farmers. And secondly, any kind of frustration as regards or restriction as regards access to the European market would be bad for the people for the farmers of Wales. We've been working with the farmers and the food companies to try to ensure that more bodies in the public sector in Wales actually procure their food from Wales. And of course local authorities or other organisations uh, don't have to buy the cheapest. We've seen an increase, for example, in the amount of meat procured from Wales going into the health service because we worked with producers to ensure that they can ensure that the supply chain is reliable. But we must, of course, emphasise the fact that this won't make up for seeing the loss or any restriction on the European market. Thank you, Chloe. And I'm sure the First Minister will want to join with me in congratulating me, the South Carnarvon Creameries, the cooperative company, company who've made the best profits ever in their long history. And I visited the site very recently and saw that there's a future for this sort of collaboration in the agricultural sector. And it was also true that those profits were based on significant investment of European funding and support from the Welsh Government. Now, in moving forward, your own Cabinet Secretary for Finance has 
give us an assurance that an internal target of spending from the structural funds from 80 percent in order to meet the needs and ensure we make the most of that. Will you set a similar target for your expenditure on the rural development program so that companies such as South Carnarvon Creamleys can invest for the future and everyone else in Wales too? Well, the funding is actually being issued or going or is being spent on the rate that we would wish and we expect that that funding will still be available until 2023. Therefore, may I join the member in congratulating South Carnarvonshire Creameries. That's the very first place that I went to when I was a minister some time ago now and I remember the history, think that it was established in 1933 and so that demonstrates how successful they have been. But having said that, I've said before that we must ensure that more cooperative groups or companies come into the um, farming industry in Wales. It's not something that is always welcomed by the industry, but we must ensure that farmers can secure a fair price for their products. And one way of doing that is to ensure that they work together in order to ensure that they don't have to sell it as individuals. We know that that the buyers would then have all the power. Will the First Minister make a statement on staff redundancies in Welsh universities? We are aware that a number of institutions are currently reviewing their staffing structures. I would expect them to engage in meaningful discussions with members of staff and the trade unions and also with the Higher Education Funding Council for Wales to explore the implications for individual institutions and their students. I'd like to congratulate my local university, Bangor, because that's the only university in Wales to win a gold award for the teaching framework of the UK government, which is a wonderful result, confirming that Bangor University is maintaining excellent standards of teaching and learning consistently for its future and that the provision in Bangor is of the highest quality seen in the UK today. But I also note that Bangor University, along with almost every other university in Wales, is consulting on possible redundancies, 117 possible forced redundancies in Bangor alone. Now, unfortunately, so many of our universities are forced to take these steps at the moment. Do you agree that it's about time the Welsh Government considered this situation in earnest and provided additional financial resources for our universities as a matter of urgency? Well, the universities are, of course, independent, and so it's up to them to take their own decisions. We, of course, do not welcome any situation where people will lose their jobs. But it shouldn't be solely government funding. They have a responsibility to ensure that more funding comes in from out with the public purse and that they should seek research funding, for example, and funds from the commercial world and they are duty bound to do that but of course we don't wish to see anybody losing their jobs in universities any university and i would say to the universities that they must do everything possible to ensure that that doesn't happen that should be the last resort and not something that they do uh, routine routinely well, Welsh universities, of course, make a huge contribution to the Welsh economy. Uh, around 5% of the Welsh economy uh, is as a result uh, of Welsh university uh, activity. And, of course, if you are losing staff uh, from a university, very often they're experienced and expensive staff uh, that the university uh, tries to uh, move on uh, first. What guarantees have you had from the university sector uh, that that will not undermine the opportunity for the sector to perform very, very well in terms of its contribution to the Welsh uh, economy, particularly uh, if significant numbers of staff are going to be shared as a result of reductions in terms of uh, certain courses and income? Well, I think it's hugely important that our universities don't hamstring themselves uh, in terms of the way they compete, not just with each other. Wales is a very small market, but across the world. Uh, and universities must consider uh, whether uh, losing staff would mean that they are no longer able uh, to provide a service for their students and possibly no longer able to uh, attract an extra income as a result. Uh, as I said in answer to the member for, for Arvon, uh, redundancy should be considered as a last resort and not as a first. Question in our
Questions now from the party leaders. Leader of the Opposition, Andrew R. T. Davis. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, First Minister, the uh, interim report from the Commission on Health and Social Care published its findings uh, today. Um, the Government obviously set this Commission in motion and the final report is due the end of this year. Uh, previous Labour governments haven't got a very good record when it comes to implementing uh, detailed findings from commissions, such as the Williams Commission, for example. Can you give us a feel of how important the government, or what importance the government attaches to the findings from the commission, and will it be the central plank for this government going forward in this assembly, the way it shapes health and social care, the recommendations that the report comes out with? Well, we wouldn't have set up the review on a cross-party basis if we weren't going to take it seriously. Obviously not. We look forward to the report when it's uh, published and that will form the basis of our thinking for the future. I think what's important for us to understand, and I commend you for setting up uh, the parliamentary review, because some of the findings uh, that they've made available today, backed up by evidence, showing obviously in the next couple of years we'll see a 44% increase in over 65s, and yet a 5% contraction in working age people, uh, show that there are real challenges to be faced. Uh, and where those challenges can be faced cross-party, obviously those solutions will come a lot more easier. Uh, but it is vital to understand, will this Commission and its recommendations meet the end that many other commissions that the Government has uh, commissioned, and I use the example again, the Williams Commission, or will these findings actually form the central plank of Government thinking going forward to the end of this Assembly in 2022? Well, I, I, we have to remember, of course, with I mean, he mentions the Williams Commission. The Williams Commission was opposed by other parties in this in this chamber. Uh, it wasn't as if the government decided off its own bat, uh, despite the support of others, uh, that, that the recommendations would uh, would move forward. Uh, with regard to health, uh, this was this is a major uh, commitment for us to make. We, we made it, of course, uh, as part of our program for for government, uh, and it is hugely important that uh, we can do as much as we can to. to to find common ground on health across parties, to understand what the challenges are, because the challenges are the same regardless of, uh, of politics, and then to see how those challenges can be met, and that's very much part of, uh, of our thinking. As I say, we will uh, look forward to receiving the, uh, the report and look forward to acting on as much of it as we can. I think what would have given us more confidence is if we could have had a clearer answer that would have said, yes, this will form our thinking going forward, the recommendations, uh, and ultimately uh, you look forward to delivering those recommendations uh, rather than just looking forward to getting the report uh, and then deciding what to do. Because time is of the essence, as Mansell Awood, Awood uh, points out, uh, the demographic time bomb has already gone off. Uh, the other part of the report talks about the skills crisis within the NHS and social care that needs addressing now. It talks of now now, not in the future, but it's actually happening with our workforce planning at the moment. And importantly, it talks about structures uh, and the way structures will, and I think the word that they use, the scale of the challenge means that the system is becoming unstable, which cannot be resolved by small step-by-step -step changes. So on this basis then, do you believe that that leads to the obvious conclusion that there will have to be whole-scale structural change uh, within the NHS here in Wales and the social care sector, or do you believe that a more incremental approach can deliver the solutions that the interim report points to that the final recommendations will suggest needs to be taken up by the Welsh Government? Well, th th there has to be change, it's clear. Uh, I wouldn't use the word wholesale. I I'm reluctant to express a view we have seen the recommendations of the report for obvious reasons, but we would want to implement as much of it as we can and to seek consensus uh, across the Chamber in order to, uh, to do that. In terms of skills, th there is no doubt that any kind of restriction on migration will make the skills uh, situation worse because, of course, the social care sector recruits heavily from outside the UK, as, of course, does the, uh, the, the medical and nursing professions. That, and that's an impact we can't control directly uh, here. But if he's asking me the question, is, the, is this simply something, an exercise that we are taking forward uh, without there being a, a clear end game? The answer to that is, is no. We want to make sure that working with other parties around this chamber, we can implement as many of the recommendations as possible. We have to see them first uh, in order to make a judgment as to uh, whether we can do that for all recommendations or most of them. Plaid Cymru Leader Leanne Wood. First Minister, all of the opposition parties in the Assembly have called for a full independent inquiry into the decisions surrounding the Circuit of Wales project. Indeed, some of your own backbenchers have said that there are serious questions to answer. The first step in that process would be the publication of your own external due diligence report, and you've agreed to publish this. 
but only when the Assembly is in recess. Now, for many of us, this looks like a government that is seeking to postpone scrutiny for a decision that was itself postponed until after the election. Can the First Minister say whether his government has yet <coughs> asked the company and the external advisers if they are happy for that report to be published? And in terms of the one piece of information placed in the public domain, which you described as unfortunate, is the First Minister able to assure us that no one associated with the government was involved in its disclosure? The leak inquiry has been initiated by the Permanent Secretary. That will have to uh, take its, uh, its course. Uh, secondly, the process of uh, talking to the organisations involved who are mentioned in the due diligence report has begun with a view to publishing it. Uh, we want to publish as much of it as possible. One of the reasons that an independent inquiry has been called for is because of a series of misleading statements made by the government, often during uh, election campaigns. I'm sure that is coincidental. Well, name them. Minister. Name them. You were asked on the 7th of April 2016 why the proposal had been rejected the day before, and you said, and I quote, what happened originally was that they were looking for a guarantee of 30 million from us. It then went up to 357 million. When asked when that happened, you said, and I quote, in the last few days. You again said to Wales Online on April the 11th, and I quote again, it was in the last few days beforehand. We weren't to know that the guarantee would be inflated. Yet a senior director of Aviva Investors, Mark Wells, contradicts what you said. He denied that Aviva had requested a 100% underwrite a few days before the rejection. He says, and again I quote, this deal has been worked up with Welsh Government through civil servants for many months and nothing in our funding structure has changed in the run-up to this announcement. First Minister, only one of the two of you can be right. Can you tell us today which one of you is right and which one of you is wrong? April 2016. So, so you weren't... Uh, that wasn't a long-term uh, discussion. Is that what you're saying, that you hadn't been in long-term discussion with that company? Are you denying that now? You said on BBC Wales on the 26th of April this year, in the run-up to the election, just a few days before, I want the circuit of Wales to, to work. End of. You added that since last year the funding model had changed. In your words, that is changing now. The model is better, you said. Can you explain what changed between that statement before the election and then the rejection a month later after the election? You've told us that in the last 10 days or so, you were told about the balance uh, sheet classification issue. Lots of concerns yep. seem to be, have been arising for you, First Minister, in the last few days. Your government's been looking at this project for six whole years. Why was the classification issued not once on this floor raised by you? Why wasn't it raised in the 28 different meetings that you had with the developers? And considering that £10 million or so of public money that has gone into this project, that could go up because the company behind the project says that there is a legal claim against this government to be made. First Minister, you decide to postpone this decision till beyond an election. You decided, to postpone, you decided to postpone the due diligence publication to when this Assembly is in recess. Why didn't you decide to postpone the final decision so that you could have at least got Aviva and everyone else around the, sit the table to see if these issues that identified in the last few days could have been resolved? Well, first of all, I'm sorry to give her a direct answer to a question she asked. She was clearly uh, knocked backwards by it uh, verbally. And let me give you some more, give, give some more direct answers. The project six years ago is not the same project as the project we dealt with. It's changed many times in terms of its financial structure. The project that we uh, looked at was a project that we had seen uh, recently uh, in, in the course of, of the last uh, few, few months. It's a project, of course, that was based on, on the guarantee that's uh, out there uh, publicly. We looked 
at uh, the financial structure that was proposed. We went through the due diligence, and the due diligence revealed that there was a very high risk of the uh, cost of the guarantee being regarded as being on balance sheet. I don't know if she knows what that means, but on balance sheet means that it would be treated as if we had given the company money now. It would mean we would find £157 million worth of capital reductions in this financial year. That's the risk that we took. Now, we worked with the company to see what we can do to help them. There was a meeting between the company and officials after the decision. It was explained to the company what the issues were, and they accepted it. They clearly haven't spoken to her because the company accepted the issue with regard to, to uh, the issue being on balance sheet and the risks that that posed to us. They did not argue with it. Could I suggest she talks perhaps to the company to take their view uh, on this? But one thing that they, the Plaid Company have never said is whether they agree with the decision or not. Until we know whether they agree or not, so we can assess whether they think that there are high risks to be taken with Welsh public spending, then, of course, I cannot accept a lecture from the leader of Plaid Cymru. Um, I agree absolutely 100% with everything that the leader of Plaid Cymru has just said. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> There are occasions when UKIP can be ecumenical. <coughs> in the interest of the Welsh people, this is one of them. And it's something which uh, perhaps we can follow up uh, in the Public Accounts Committee, if not in a public inquiry, if that not be not granted. <coughs> but I want to ask about the First Minister's forthcoming meeting with Michel Barnier, the EU Chief Negotiator on Brexit, which I understand is happening on Thursday. Is he going to use this opportunity to compliment the UK government's negotiating strategy or to seek to <laughs> undermine it. I believe that the First Minister accepts that we are going to leave the single market and uh, the government has said it is going to leave the customs union. Uh, that is something which I don't believe to be negotiable. Uh, I read that he is going to say to Michel Barnier that uh, it's uh, vital in the interests of Welsh jobs that we remain, uh, if not members of the single market, at least with full frictionless uh, access to it. Uh, but does he not accept that when you go into a negotiation, uh, like Michel Barnier himself, you should play hardball, not softball? If you go into a negotiation accepting the fundamental tenets of the other side's arguments, then you're not likely to get the deal that you want, but a worse one. So what he should explain to Michel Barnier on Thursday is the advantages of mutuality here, both to the Europeans and to the British, of having the maximum possible free trade between us, and simply using this as an opportunity to grandstand against the negotiating strategy of the UK government is likely to fail anyway, but will also do the Welsh Government no good in its dealings with the UK Government at home. Well, I'm grateful for his display of telepathy telling me what I'm going to say on Thursday. I'm grateful for his advice on that. I can say that I'm not going there to negotiate. I'm going there to explain the position that we have taken as a government in our white paper uh, agreed with, uh, with Plaid Cymru. And our position is, is very clear publicly. The words we are leaving the EU, the terms upon which we leave the EU are uh, hugely important as with regards undermining the UK's negotiating strategy. I have no idea what that is. And until we have a better idea what the UK government's own view on these things, rather than different voices, Boris Johnson again today, Michael Gove saying something different, David Davis saying something different, the Prime Minister saying something that she's repeated several times over that she's seen on a piece of paper, we need to know what the position of the UK government actually is. We don't know that. The First Minister is obfuscating here. He knows perfectly well that the aim of the UK government is the same as the aim of the Welsh government, and that is to achieve the maximum possible degree of free trade between the UK and the EU. But this is a reciprocal process. And if we are not granted free trade to Europe, we will not grant the EU free trade with us. And given that they have a trade deficit of £61 billion a year, with us. It's as much in their interests as it is in ours, as it is in trade worldwide, that we reduce barriers to the free exchange of goods and services. So if he uses this opportunity on Thursday to reinforce that message, he may do himself a bit of good with the UK government by going with the grain. I wholly agree with what he said earlier on about uh, DEFRA ministers not meeting w with Welsh ministers. I do believe that was disrespectful and, and unhelpful. But it may be that the attitude of the UK government towards the Welsh government is informed by the approach which he and his colleagues have taken 
to the Brexit negotiations. They may think, what is the point of meeting with them, because they're only going to disagree with us. Well, the, the, the Prime Minister went into the general election on the basis of obtaining a mandate to leave the single market, leave the customs union, and leave the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. On each of those points, she failed. She failed. The British people did not support that view. And so now it's incumbent on us to find a way that provides the greatest level of consensus. Yes, we're leaving. Yes, nobody wants WTO rules to apply, but they will apply unless there is at least a transitional period, because there's not going to be a deal by March 2019. No, nobody surely can believe that, given you know, I've spoken to trade negotiators, and they'd say to me, it takes 18 months to agree on what you're going to talk about, let alone getting a, a deal. These things are, are, by nature, very, very uh, complicated. So it is hugely important that we look at transitional arrangements. We have put forward, we've put forward our view, it's in a white paper. You know, it's very clear whether people agree with it or not, at least people can see that it's there. I have no idea what the UK government's current position now is. That's in no one's interests, uh, and it's hugely important that they work with the devolved administrations to get there. We don't start from a position of trying to undermine the UK government. We will be vocal publicly if we disagree with what they're saying, but that's not where we start. But unfortunately, we can't even get to that point because the UK government at the moment has shut up shop to ourselves and Scotland. Now, that is not a sensible way forward if we're going to get a, a Brexit deal that attracts support across the UK. I've made my point on that, uh, but the EU comprises another 27 member states. With almost all of them, uh, we have a trade deficit. In Germany's case, for example, we have a trade deficit which amounts to £25 billion a year. One in ten of every cars made in Germany is exported to the United Kingdom. Uh, there is a massive interest in Germany in retaining the maximum possible free trade with Britain. Uh, there is a huge deficit in most agricultural products uh, in the, the UK, uh, and therefore there is, again, a mutuality of interest in maintaining the maximum possible freedom, for example, to export French wine, uh, subject to, to the, uh, the, the lowest possible form of, of restriction. Uh, and therefore, I'm asking the First Minister whether he will take steps, along with his colleagues, to do a tour of the capitals of Europe to talk to the governments of individual member states, because they won't be involved directly in the Brexit negotiating process, in order to see what mutuality of interest we can engender there to help put pressure upon the EU Commission, which is of course unelected, to take the most liberal attitude towards free trade between our respective countries? Well, well first of all, it's been made absolutely clear, and there is, there is no dissent amongst EU27 about this that the UK's uh, future arrangement cannot be as beneficial as membership of the EU. You know, for obvious reasons, uh, th th they take the view, you can't have your cake and eat it, to use that phrase. That's the first thing to remember. The European Union is now stronger and more united, probably, than ever it has been. We must be very, very careful that that isn't a unity against the UK, and diplomacy must be used to make sure that that doesn't happen. This is not a negotiation of equals. The EU is eight times bigger than the UK. Its market's far, far larger. It's far more attractive to foreign investors and exporters than the UK is, because it's got far, big, far more consumers than the UK. So we have to come at this with a, with a realistic, from a realistic viewpoint. He makes the point about the EU exporting more to the UK than the UK to the EU in terms of numbers. Well, it would be odd if it didn't, given the fact it's eight times bigger. Of course, it's going to export more in terms of money and numbers. But if you look at percentages, Actually, we export far more of our exports into the European market than, than uh, EU products coming into the UK. I think about 80% of the EU's, uh, of EU27's exports go into the UK. For, and from Wales' perspective, it's 67% the other way. So actually, as a percentage, we stand to lose far more than, than uh, Europe does. Bear in mind, of course, the EU has just signed a free trade deal with Japan. The German car manufacturers will eye that very, very greedily because uh, they will look at, at, at a free trade agreement with Japan. It's a huge opportunity for them in a market that's twice the size of the UK, bluntly, twice the size of the UK. The German car manufacturers have already said that they are, you know, from their perspective, they'd want the UK to stay in. They are not going to press their own government for some kind of special deal for the UK. And the Germans value the EU and its unity more than anything else. I mean, that's been very clear over, over the course of the past uh, few months. BMW are not a member state of the EU. Uh, and that's something we should remember. We, be re we are realistic. Mutuality is important. A good deal for all is important, but of course we're now faced with a position with a Prime Minister who went into an election with a clear programme of what she wanted to do and lost, or failed, failed to win the election as a result of that. And that's why it's so important 
that the UK Government works with the devolved administrations to get to a position on Brexit that we can all try and support. But so far, the door has been shut. Question three, Vicky. Question three, Vicky Howell. Power. Will the First Minister outline the actions being taken to ensure that children and young people in the Cannon Valley do not go hungry during school holidays? We are providing £500,000 for 2017-18 to, to accelerate the rollout of the WLGA Summer Holiday Programme. Uh, and Penawine Primary School in Aberdeer is one of the sites benefiting from the funding. Uh, thank you, First Minister. During the year 2015 to 2016, there were over 8,300 children uh, who were eligible for free school meals within Ron the Cunnan Taff. And this means that more than one in ten of all children in Wales who are eligible for free school meals reside within my county borough. New research from the Trussell Trust suggests that, and I quote, lone parents and their children are notably more likely to use food banks, suggesting that even compared to the low-income population, lone parents and their children are particularly vulnerable to needing food banks. This is especially a problem within larger families and is exacerbated greatly during the school holidays when these families have no access to uh, free school meals. We know that the Welsh Government has plans for an extended system of lunch and fun clubs. Um, so I'd like to ask how are preparations go in ahead of the school holidays, which start in just a few weeks' time, and what evaluation of the scheme in tackling holiday hunger will take place? Well, we are working with the WLGA in order to move the uh, scheme forward, of course, in the uh, coming, uh, to the coming su uh, summer holidays. Uh, evaluation is in place. Evaluation, for example, of the previous scheme uh, was, of the pilot scheme rather, was done and indeed was published in February 2017. Uh, and the findings uh, are made in relation to health, uh, social, and education uh, outcomes. And the findings that we saw from the pilot scheme are very encouraging. David Melding. First Minister, this is a very important issue, and uh, I commend the Education Secretary's announcement uh, earlier this year to uh, uh, pilot these uh, lunch and fun clubs. Um, aimed at it for primary schools at first, which uh, I, I just wonder if it's going to be a scheme you will examine for the secondary school sector, because uh, uh, helping uh, those that receive uh, free school uh, uh, lunches uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, healthy nutrition, eating and uh, healthy and program ac of activities, education attainment, all these things are very, very important. That group uh, has some of the poorest educational attainment uh, of any uh, that attend school, some of it because the school holiday itself uh, is not very conducive to keeping that pattern of learning going. So this is an area I think needs careful examination. Well, of course, we, we money uh, restricts what we, we might want to, uh, to do, uh, but with the programme rolling out over the course of this summer, uh, of course there will be an evaluation of it, as I have said, and in, in future years, of course, we'll keep under consideration how the programme might be extended when and if the finance becomes available. Neil McAvoy. First Minister, your, your party has been running the Welsh Government for 18 years, and yet there are still children going hungry. 200,000 children in Wales live in poverty. Don't you think that it's a disgrace that a member of your own party has to stand up here and ask you about children going hungry in the Cannon Valley, when you've had so long to do something about that. What, why have he failed? Why have he failed? What did he do as Deputy Leader of Cardiff, I wonder, in terms of taking this forward? Not, not much, uh, I, uh, I suspect, but he's always keen, of course, to point the finger elsewhere. Look, uh, he is right to point out that there are children uh, going hungry. Uh, much of that is to do with the current policies of austerity pursued by the UK Government, over which we have uh, little or no influence. But we can see uh, that there are more and more children uh, who find themselves in families who are unable to cope financially, which is why we're putting this programme in place, in order that in Wales we have a programme that helps young children through the summer and makes sure that they can have food in their bellies over the summer. That is, to my mind, uh, true socialism, true socialism, and something, indeed, we should be proud of in terms of what we're doing in Wales. Question, Pedwar. Question four, Mark Ishwood. Uh, will the First Minister make a statement on employability programmes in Wales? Well, the Minister for Skills and Science will make a statement setting out the Welsh Government's approach to employability later this afternoon, and that will set out how we'll deliver our Taking Wales Forward commitment to reshape employability support in order to enable individuals to gain and maintain sustainable employment. 
uh, well, thank you for that. Uh, as you'll be aware, the uh, UK Government's Work and Health Programme in Wales is currently out to tender, forecast to reach 16,000 disabled people, those with health conditions or those out of work for more than two years, although there are 270,000 uh, economically inactive people in Wales, excluding students and pensioners, according to Welsh Government figures. Um, how will you uh, address concerns expressed to me that the Welsh Government's employability programmes, which we will hear more about uh, later, um, are currently, we understood, not projected to begin until April uh, 2019, having slipped a year, and further that there will be only one prime contractor operating left in Wales, despite the Welsh Government's uh, statement it wants to use multiple suppliers, and that if it doesn't act now, um, will be forced to rely on external uh, companies coming into Wales to provide uh, those services. Uh, and, and finally, in this context, to address to the statement uh, to the cross-party group on industrial communities today by the Bevan Foundation, that in terms of employability, we need a one-stop shop, quote, with wiring of schemes behind the scenes in a seamless service, whether they're UK, Wales or third sector. Well, I mean, the, uh, the Minister said we'll make a statement later on uh, this afternoon. Uh, he is right to say that we're looking to commence delivery uh, of our new programme in April of 2019. Uh, while we transition uh, to the, program new, uh, the new programme, rather, we are looking at what we can do now to better support individuals into employment. Those transition arrangements will focus on making amendments to the current employability programmes for the interim period up to April 2019 in order to deliver greater impact. We're testing and trialling these approaches to support the Valleys Task Force agenda. Uh, and uh, again, there's a statement on that, if I remember rightly, uh, this afternoon, uh, and that will inform the development then of the employability delivery plan. Rhiannon Passmore. Uh, the Welsh Government, our programme for government taking Wales forward includes a commitment to reshape employable, employability support for job-ready individuals and for those furthest away from the labour market. It is important to recognise that employability is not just about jobs and skills, it is about getting every aspect of government policy, education, health, housing, communities working together to support people into sustainable jobs. First Minister, what does the Welsh people's endorsement of Welsh Labour at the Assembly local and general elections over the last year say about how the people view our plans for increasing employability in our nation? Well, of course, it shows that the people of Wales trust Welsh Labour to deliver uh, economically, socially and for their uh, communities. And, of course, we saw that again last month. Question Pimp, Mike. Question 5, Mike Edges. Will, will the First Minister outline the Welsh Government's support for the Swansea Bay City region? Well, we are working with local partners to support business growth, to improve infrastructure and to create a more attractive economic environment across the region. I can I thank the First Minister for that response. Uh, the sub first supplementary budget uh, provides an extra £20 million for the Cardiff City region. Will the Swansea State Bay City region get the same financial support from the Welsh Government when it needs it? Yes, uh, the Swansea City deal is structured around 11 major project proposals. There is a process set out that triggers the money going to Swansea in the same way as Cardiff. It's not identical, but the Welsh and UK governments have committed to jointly invest, subject to the submission and approval of full business cases in relation to the 11 identified projects and the agreement of governance arrangements for the deal, a sum of up to £241 million on specific interventions. Susie Davis. Thank you for that answer, uh, First Minister. It's been um, over three months now since the uh, uh, deal was signed between yourself and the Prime Minister, yet as far as I understand it, the governance structure is still unresolved. Um, I think work need, does need to move on now on delivering those projects that are worth £1.3 billion to the, uh, the local area and beyond, with a strong focus on the commercialisation and economic development of ideas, as well as the uh, social and wellbeing goals, of course. I'm wondering, um, have you given any consideration to... Um, delivering the Welsh Government oversight of this through the um, Economy and Infrastructure Department rather than through the uh, Finance and Local Government Department? Uh, no, there are no plans to change that. The, the reason why the governance arrangements haven't been agreed yet is because the general election intervened, and that, of course, uh, set back the, uh, the timetable. Uh, but we are, we are keen, of course, to get to a position where the governance arrangements are uh, agreed in order to see the deal being delivered successfully. Simon Thomas. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. What message would it send to those involved in the city uh, Swansea Bay uh, City Deal region if we lose a huge renewable investment project in the Tidal Lagoon due to dither and delay by the Westminster Government? And have you had any indication at all that they're going to make a decision on this? 
what impressions they give? A poor one. Have we had any suggestion that they are close to making a decision? No. Uh, again, there is no reason why this project should not proceed. Uh, the Secretary of State for Wales, I think today, said that he supported the Swansea Bay Tidal Lagoon. Well, if he says he supports it, he must deliver it. He is the Secretary of State for Wales. He can't say he supports something and then say, well, of course, I can't help to deliver it. It's, it's, you know, he has said that, and it's hugely important then that he is, uh, he is able to, uh, to, to make sure that his voice is heard on the UK Cabinet table. I mean, if, if the Tidal Lagoon doesn't come, uh, what, what assessment do we make of the voice of the Secretary of State for Wales around that, uh, around that table? So, uh, yes, we know that a thousand jobs will be created by the Tidal Lagoon. We know uh, that the UK government needs to make its mind up now in terms of the financial arrangements surrounding the Lagoon. We know there's been a review. We know there is no reason now why it should not proceed. If a billion pounds can be given to Northern Ireland, there is no reason why the Lagoon can't proceed. Caroline Jones. Dear Llywydd, uh, First Minister, the City Bay region, the City region has the potential not only to transform the Swansea Bay region, but also deliver wider benefits um, to Wales as a whole. Um, the Internet of Life Science and Wellbeing could help reshape the way we deliver healthcare in future. Um, key to the success of the Internet Coast vision of the City region is the transatlantic cable. Um, can you provide an update, First Minister, on the progress made in bringing the fibre optic cable from New York to Oxwich Bay, which is within my region? Well, I'll write to the, uh, to the member on that, but of course this, this is part of the ongoing uh, development of business cases as part of the city deal, but I, I will write to her in more detail in terms of that specific project. Here we're Anka Davis. Uh, um, I very much welcome the uh, news today that we've had that the Secretary of State, Greg Clark, will actually meet with a cross-party delegation of chairs of uh, prominent committees here to advocate the case once again for the Tidal Lagoon. And I thank him for the courtesy he's extended to that cross-party delegation. First Minister will know that we had a debate here before the general election where there was universal support for the Tidal Lagoon and for the findings of the Henry uh, Review here in this chamber. It also has the backing of the higher education sector, the construction sector, the business sector, the CBI, individual businesses, the unions, local government cross-party, right across the board. So we will welcome the opportunity of taking that delegation and stressing the strong commitment. Would he agree with me that there could be no better signal of the UK government taking an active, direct interest in Wales in terms of energy, but also in terms of national infrastructure than to give the go-ahead for the Tidal Lagoon in Swansea. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, it presses all the right buttons, if you pardon the, uh, pardon the use of that expression, in terms of job creation, in terms of sustainability, in terms of the environment, in terms of it being a clean source of energy, in terms of reliability and predictability. You know, there is no reason why this project should not go ahead. We need that decision soon so the UK government shows that the amount of money it has already committed to uh, Northern Ireland can be, at uh, can be matched to, uh, to part to the money it's prepared to commit to Wales. Question, Question six, Dyloid. Thank you, Llywydd. Will the First Minister outline what steps the Welsh Government is taking to encourage individuals to learn new languages? Welsh Government places a great value on the teaching and learning of all languages, be that English, Welsh or modern foreign languages. As a demonstration of this, the Welsh Government has put in place Global Futures, a five-year plan to improve and promote modern foreign languages in schools. Thank you for that response, First Minister. You may be aware of the Scottish Language Fair, which is free of charge to the public and receive, uh, receives official support from the Scottish Government. The event is held for anyone who takes an interest in languages, and it includes seminars and taster sessions on languages and cultural performances in an incredible celebration of world languages. It's a lively, exciting celebration which places minority languages alongside the major or so-called major languages of the world. Now, following this success, is the Welsh Government open to the concept of holding and supporting a lang language fair here in Wales? Well, it's true to say that we would be open to the idea. We would have to study how it works in Scotland. May I say to the member, of course, that one of the things that will be happening in the autumn is that the language institutions of France, as Spain and Germany are going to open offices in Cardiff and that's a very major step forward to ensure that there are sufficient number of teachers available to teach modern languages. 
Prime uh, Officer. Yeah. The latest language trend Wales report found that the teachers were extremely worried about the future of modern foreign languages. More than a third of Welsh schools now have less than 10% of 14 to 15 years old studying a modern foreign language. And the statistic is 44% of schools have fewer than five people studying foreign language at AS level, and 61% have fewer than five foreign language people at A levels. Given the global future is having a limited impact, what action will the Welsh government take to stem the serious decline in modern language, modern foreign language learning in Wales, please? Well, I mean, this, the, the, the Global Futures, uh, remember, is a five-year plan uh, that's aimed at improving uh, and promoting modern foreign languages, so the judgment of that will be after five years. I mean, there is no question that there will be uh, a need for our students to develop foreign language skills in the future. One of the issues around Brexit, which has not yet been properly understood or explored, is that English is, is, is per se the second language of people in the European Union. If the UK leaves, the influence of English starts to diminish. What does that mean? It may mean nothing, but we don't know uh, what that will mean in terms of other languages becoming more predominant then within, within Europe and the need for our own uh, children and young people to learn those languages as a result. It's why, of course, the Global Futures was published in October 2015, uh, with a view, of course, to improving the situation markedly by 2020. Question 7, Rina Piorwerth. On uh, very similar lines, will the First Minister make a statement on the state of modern languages teaching in secondary schools in Wales? Well, I'm not very fond of saying can I refer the member to my previous answer, but of course, my answer is along the same lines. Namely, we have a strategy in order to ensure that more language teachers are available and that more pupils study the modern languages. It's been a pleasure to welcome pupils from three primary schools from Anglesey to the Assembly today. And I was discussing the teaching of an additional languages with pupils from Parkabont and Cornheer, and the pupils of Cornheer are already being given French lessons on a weekly basis. And as bilingual pupils, they were very eager to see opportunities to push their linguistic boundaries, but of course the evidence tells us that there has been a great decline in the number of pupils learning a modern foreign language in secondary schools in Wales. The latest report from the British Council Language Trends in Wales shows a decline of almost 50% in terms of the pupils taking a GCSE and A level now in a modern foreign language as compared to the situation 15 years ago. Now a series of Labour ministers for education have failed to prevent that slide. But does the First Minister now agree with the latest demand of the cross-party group on International Wales for the talk of an ambition of creating a bilingual Wales and a bilingual Wales plus one should turn now to action, particularly in the context of the fact that the new curriculum is in the pipeline? Well, this is extremely important that we consider this. There is an emphasis, of course, today in this chamber and outside uh, this chamber of how we attain the target of a million Welsh speakers by 2050. But, of course, that doesn't mean to say that we're going to forget other modern languages. And, of course, one of the things we will ensure that is done is to yoke the Welsh language strategy to the global future strategy in order to ensure that our children learn more than two languages in future. Thank you, First Minister. The next item is the business statement.